Hello folks. Today we're going to be talking about differential amplifiers. Part one. We're going to look at the DC analysis. Differential amplifiers are the core building block of operational amplifiers. So it's good we understand how they work. Essentially, this is a, a configuration that has two inputs and one output. It takes the difference between the two input voltages to produce an output voltage. How does it do this? Well, let's take a look at a simple example. I'm going to use bipolar transistors on this, although you could just as easily make a diff amp from JFETs or MOSFETs. I'm drawing NPNs, but you could also use PNPs. You could use Darlingtons. You have options. So we're just going to look at the DC version of this. So I have two transistors sort of mirror imaged here. Everything that's on the uh, left hand side is going to be identical to what's on the right hand side. So this resistor, I'll call this the one side, RC1 is the same as RC2, and base resistor 1 is the same as base resistor 2. Transistor 1, Q1, is going to be the same as Q2. Ideally, it'll be a matched pair. Down here, we're going to have a current source. So in the simplified version, we would just say, hey, there's a current source here. We would call that IT for I tail. In the old days, these were known as long-tailed pairs. That's where the I tail comes from. In a very simple configuration, what we would do for a current source is just have a resistor going down to a negative power supply. Most of that voltage would drop across the resistor and that would establish the current. Okay? All right. If everything is perfectly matched, and this is key, if everything is perfectly matched, this current, this tail current, will split evenly between the two halves. So in other words, the current coming down through transistor 1 will be identical to that of transistor 2. So IC1 equals IC2. Now if that's the case, then all the voltage drops, right, like the drop across RC1, is the same as the drop across RC2. That's just Ohm's law. And of course, if those two resistors are identical, then it should be the case that the voltage at collector 1 is equal to the voltage at collector 2. In other words, if you took a DMM and you went from one collector to the other, you should measure zero volts. And of course, the currents going into the bases would be identical, and whatever small base voltage you have would be identical. The two halves are just mirror images. That's the way it should be. Now, the reality, of course, is that these things are never perfectly matched. We always have something going on. So let's just first calculate up one of these, and then we can look at where things get a little funky. So I'm going to use the same setup, although I am going to use a little... Um, resistor current source over here. All right, uh, just to make things easy for ourselves, because I don't want to have to pick up a calculator, I'm going to make this power supply a negative 20.7 volts. I know that's kind of an odd number, but bear with me. I'm going to put 10K in for the tail resistor and then a couple of 2K resistors on the bases and finally some 5Ks on the two collector resistors. So here's the way this should work out. The drops across the 2K should be small enough to ignore. We'll have very small negative voltages, DC voltages on our bases. 
small enough to ignore. Um, we'll have our 7 tenths of a volt drop on each base emitter, but they're basically in parallel in this configuration. So this point right here where the two emitters meet will be around negative 0.7 volts, which means from negative 20.7 on the other side, you're going to have about 20 volts dropping across that 10K. So Ohm's law says that your tail current should be 20 minus 20.7 uh, 20 minus the 0.7, which is 20 volts, dropping across 10K or 2 mils. If these two things are perfectly matched, then IC1 equals IC2, and through Kirchhoff's current law, they have to add up to I tail, in other words, equals I tail divided by 2. Or in our case, that's a milliamp each. So I've got a milliamp through here, got a milliamp down through here. So the voltage across each of these resistors, right, the voltage across generic RC should be 1 mil times 5K or 5 volts. All right, so that's the drop from here to here or from here to here. That leaves our collectors, VC1 and VC2, would have to equal your power supply minus the drop on RC. In other words, 15 volts minus 5 volts, which is 10 volts. Okay? All right. Uh, if I have a known beta value, let's say beta is 100, nice round number, perfectly matched for each of these things, then I would know that the base currents would be 1 milliamp divided by 100. So that's 10 mics. And if I pass 10 microamps through 2K, the drop the magnitude of the drop across VB would be 10 mics times 2K, or 20 millivolts. Of course, the currents are flowing up into the base, so the polarity is plus to minus ground up, so a negative 0.02 volts sitting on the two bases. That's what we would expect to see if everything was perfect. Okay, so one definition of perfection is that which cannot be obtained. You will never have this thing be perfect. Possible error sources. Well, beta 1 is never going to be exactly the same as beta 2. The transconductance curves of these two transistors are not going to be identical. What does that mean practically speaking? It means that VBE for number 1 is not going to be the same as VBE for number 2. What do you think the chances are that you would get the exact same value for the two collector resistors or for the two base resistors? It's not going to happen. Slight variations are going to occur. Well, just as a very quick example, what if everything was perfect except for these two resistors? Right? That was the only thing. Maybe one of these resistors was slightly high. Let's say that this guy right here is just a little bit on the high side. What does that do? Well, if it's a little on the high side, this voltage will be a little bit higher, which means that this collector voltage will be a little bit lower, which means that the differential between the two collectors won't be zero anymore. As a matter of fact, this voltage will be slightly higher than this. We get a slight positive voltage from here to here. That's just if one resistor's off. Now, what if your betas are off? Well, that means your two base currents aren't going to be identical, and that means your two base voltages won't be identical. All right, so you can see how all these little bits are kind of coming together, and they're going to shift things up and down, and sometimes they'll sort of fight each other, and sometimes they'll reinforce each other. So we would like to get some idea of, of how good the overall circuit is. Okay, what's sort of like a generic way of talking about this? Well, we come up with some parameters. Uh, let's start with that issue with the base. Right? I would like to know what the input bias current is. Right? Typically, eh, we might call that just uh, like IN bias. Okay. There isn't a nice, accepted, totally accepted name for this, but I'll just call it IN bias.
Well, what's that going to be? It's essentially just the average of your two base currents. Okay, so we could just say it's IB1 plus IB2 divided by 2. Yeah, that's what it averages out to be. Um, but how good is the match? Well, that we call the input offset current. All right, that we actually have a name for, IOS, the input offset current. And what we do is we look at the difference between these two things, IB1 and IB2. All right, take the absolute value of that, just the magnitude. Um, so that gives us the difference, okay? And whatever we come up with, ideally it'll be zero, but, you know, whatever we come up with, that's our input offset current, All right? Just take the absolute because we don't care, you know, really one way or the other, who's high, who's low. We just want to know how far off they are. Then looking at the output end, we can talk about an output offset voltage. All right, so I was talking a moment ago about the two collectors not being identical. Okay, so we call that VOS. And it's a very similar sort of thing. It's just a matter of what is uh, the absolute value of VC1 minus VC2. All right, so ideally, in the ideal case, this thing is zero. There is no offset current. They're identical. Same thing for the output offset voltage. That's also zero. In reality, they're not going to be. So the thing to remember is smaller is better. Okay? All right. Now that we have some idea of what the DC is doing, we can look at the AC side of the equation. Okay? You know, this is just sort of getting the circuit idling. Now we want to, now we want to do something with it. Okay? All right. We'll look at that in the next video.